I'll continue to do some um, housekeeping just throughout, just to remind folks, because I'm certain folks will join and be confused that they can't see themselves. Um, however, that is so that we can record this and make it available externally as well. We, oh, let's see, I lost Elaine's camera. Um, I will, once I have both folks back, we'll, I'll do introductions. All right, we got one. Uh, for folks that are just now joining, um, we were paying homage to Tina Turner when things got started um, with some with some classics. So um, thank you both for being here. Thank you to our attendees. I'm so thrilled. Um, I want to share just a little bit of the background um, in making this come to, to life. First, a huge shout out to Elaine and the entire team at Asia, um, you know, admittedly trying to coordinate these things over email um, is not always easy. And I know for a fact that during um, Heritage and History Months like this month, I can only imagine how um, full your schedule is. So thank you so much for, for being here, both you and Marcus. Um, it just, it means a lot to us to be able to have this conversation um, and for me to continue to build these relationships with uh, our, our community partners. So um, thank you both for being here. I'm going to jump into intros. Um, Elaine So serves as the CEO at Asian Services in Action, Asia. In this role, she is responsible for leading the largest health and social services agency in the state of Ohio, focused on addressing the needs of Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders, immigrants, and refugees. Asia's mission is to serve, support, and advocate for AAPIs and immigrants and refugees so they prosper and flourish. Elaine supervises the leadership team responsible for direct health and social services, policy advocacy, cap capacity building, community engagement, and special projects. Elaine also has the responsibility for ensuring compliance of the requirements for Asia's International Community Health Center, a federally qualified health center in FQHC. Please welcome Elaine. Hi, everyone. Next, we have Marcus Biswa. Did I say that right? Yes. Marcus exactly. Biswa has served as a bilingual community mental health, health outreach worker for Asia since 2021. Mr. Biswa was born in Bhutan and came to the United States in 2008. He has diverse and unique life experiences and is passionate about helping others. As a veterinary assistant in Bhutan, he transferred his skills to working as a volunteer health assistant with the Save the Children Fund and Association for Medical Doctors of Asia while, Bhutan, while in a Bhutanese refugee camp in Nepal. He continued serving in the camp management team in 1993, then taking on a position of a teacher from 1995 to 2005. He developed and learned to work as a counselor for the In Charge of Youth Friendly Center, Gold Hat Bhutanese Re Refugee Camp from 1995 to 2008. Since settling in the States in 2008, Mr. Biswa has worked as a veterinary assistant before pursuing a school service career as a liaison for Erie School District. Opportunities in community services led him to Akron, Ohio in 2020. Please welcome Marcus Biswa. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I mean, both of you incredibly um, impressive, cool, but I do have to say as a like, a uh, deep, deep dog person. I did not see the veterinary assistant. And I feel like now I have to change my whole line of questioning because I have so many questions for you specifically, Marcus, about that experience. But perhaps if we have time later, um, we'll get to jump into some of that. Um, but again, our casual conversation series is an opportunity um, for Ohio Guide Zone staff and interns to learn more about different cultures, not just from the perspective of, you know, a mental health organization, but also from, you know, this opportunity to witness conversations that they might not be a part of um, in their day-to-day -day lives. And so the first thing that I want to do um, is like a, a soft opening question that's much more about um, cultural curiosity. Uh, and it's very simple. Uh, what is your favorite cultural comfort food? Uh, we'll start with Elaine and then go to Marcus. 
Yeah, it's too hard to to, to narrow it down to, to just one, but, yeah. but I'm narrowing it down to um, two different things that I, I really love and really give me comfort. So um, I'm a huge fan of, of rice noodles. So anytime I get to have um, something that, that is made with this little special, special flour that turn into rice noodles, I really like it. Um, and then on those chillier nights um, in, in Northeast Ohio, I like to have, um, there's this little hot pot of um, beef brisket that I really like, and it's full of delicious Asian spices. And um, it brings me, you know, fond, nostalgic childhood memories of, you know, that warm soup um, on a chilly night. Beautiful. Thank you. Marcus? Uh, yeah, my favorite food is uh, uh, like uh, Bhutanese uh, red rice. It's like sticky type and also the national curry of uh, Bhutan. Actually, since I was uh, born in Bhutan, I prefer, I happen to travel a lot in the uh, eastern and western side where Bhutanese uh, were there. So I prefer those. It's very, a uh, little bit uh, spicy uh, with, uh, added with butter. They cook it very nicely. They don't, a uh, little bit butter and it's very nice. So I prefer that one. And after, uh, like as a Nepali, myself being a Nepali community, I prefer rice and dal. I am uh, testing two types of uh, cultural food, so. Yeah, you have um, multiple options. Are there um, recommendations for any particular restaurant uh, that folks could give a shot if they're interested in trying either the curry or the beef brisket hot pot um, that you know you would give two thumbs up? Uh, yes, uh, there's uh, VIP, uh, VIP and uh, Momo House is there as far and yes yeah. those two other ones that uh, i have been going yes and but, i i go um, to siam cafe to get yeah. um my the the beef brisket hot pot and i get the rice noodles at liwa in asia plaza yes love liwa um and i'm 100 going to follow up with you all after this to make sure that i get the right recommendations because i like to send them out to our staff too um, but now I want to shift a little bit more into, you know, the focus of our conversation today. Um, I'll start with Elaine, um, you know, from the executive leadership standpoint, um, but I'm, I'm really excited to hear from both of you. Um, so if you could tell us a little bit about um, the organization Asia and, you know, both of you describe your role. Um, but, you know, how do you serve Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders, immigrants and refugees in Cleveland? What does that look like? Yeah, so we are um, oftentimes the, the first stop when a new arrival comes to this uh, country, comes to Northeast Ohio. Um, as a federally qualified health center, we offer refugee health screening. So when someone is, is newly arrived, that is their initial check to make sure that they um, you know, have, have what they need in terms of their, their medical needs. And then because we have a integrated social, social services or um, what some people call the social drivers of health um, um, resources, we have all the wraparound, wraparound services. So we make those referrals in case someone needs um, food or housing or um, job placement, um, legal services. We, we have those um, wraparound services available as well. And um, in terms of finding out if the community has some different need, I have a, um, well, we at Asia, we have an outreach team that learns the needs of the community by going out into the community and collecting information um, whenever they're connecting with the community members. And then we either guide them to existing resources and services that we have, or we develop um, develop and or refer the community to um, resources if we do not offer them internally. So um, we're always listening and we're responding to what the community says um, to direct them to services that might benefit them. And Marcus, uh, as a, um, in that outreach team, do you wanna talk a little bit about what that looks like in your sort of day-to-day um, -day work? 
Well, yeah, just to myself as an uh, bilingual uh, mental health community outreach worker, I uh, try my best uh, to reach out to the community because we have come from a situation where we had a lot of uh, PTSD, a lot of traumatic uh, things uh, that have uh, we carried uh, in Nepal. Myself um, uh, also being evicted, I try to reach out of those people in the community as far as possible, but uh, it's always hard whenever uh, like uh, mental health, anything is just like that, it is a stigma in our community. It is the same. So still we got to break that knot and get in and try to educate uh, people in different ways. Like uh, we give mental health first aid training. Uh, we do uh, like uh, two, three times a year. We try our best to um, do more. And also we do drug and addiction uh, thing. We do twice a year and we are doing our best to uh, reach out to the community that mental health is not simple. We try our best. And also when um, some of the clients uh, are referred, I try to uh, see what is their best need. And sometimes we get referral from outside, sometimes internal referral. So I try my best to search their needs and try to refer them to the right uh, facility. Even <clears throat> like Portress Path, if there's need for certain needs, I refer to Portress Path also. And there are some other facilities as to their uh, requirement uh, need. I get contact with the facility uh, outside of our area and we I try to do this best possible. Thanks. I, I have some follow-up questions that I'm going to save for a little bit just because it, it actually relates to a specific question um, that I have. But I think this is actually a really good segue into the next question. Um, you know, it's it's really important to acknowledge the impact of having people who are parts of certain communities or belong to certain communities serving those communities. Um, you know, the AAPI community, um, as a as a queer person, having worked at the LGBT center before, you know, that impact of having a shared identity and providing care for people um, offers a really unique insight. So a two part question. Uh, the first is, what is, you know, what is your favorite part about getting to do that work within your community? Um, and the other side, you know, what is the hardest part of serving community that you belong to? Um, and maybe we'll start with Marcus and then go to Elaine. Okay, uh, the favorite part of uh, serving my community, uh, they are very much approachable. Uh, they are uh, like uh, uh, hospitable people. So we shouldn't have to fear or oh, something may happen. Uh, they may not uh, agree uh, for things so, uh, when making an appointment. Uh, and the easiest thing, we speak same language that makes me easy with the community. And I know their culture since we are from same ethnic group, we know each other uh, culture. And uh, so, so it, that makes easier uh, to work with, my, with the community. And the hardest part um, is they don't follow time. Suppose if we say ATM, you have to be here at 8 a.m. They are five, 10 minutes late or even, so that's the hardest thing. Even <laughs> making phone calls doesn't work. So that's the hardest part that I see. And mental health issues, whenever we have to approach with mental health issues, and since it has been a stigma and it is very hard, it is the same in the community to say anyone is uh, mentally sick. So that's not, not accepted. They take it as uh, like something, uh, witchcraft or something happened or they, he might have seen in the few uh, before uh, uh, like, like oh, they take it that way or some his parents might have seen that's why he's born like this or something might be going in his life so it's not easy to express uh, I have uh, I'm mentally sick yeah so, so they don't come to the uh, for treatment uh, unless they do a lot of things uh, culturally, uh, traditionally at home, 
or they go to traditional healers, then not, if nothing works, then they come to the uh, for the appointments. They call for uh, services. Yeah. So the your favorite part is that you know there's this approachability, there's this understanding between um, you and the folks that you're providing care for um, because of that shared understanding around culture. But one of the difficult parts is within that culture the stigma or misunderstanding around mental health and mental health care and you know trying to get folks to see the value of perhaps um you know maybe in, uh institutional men mental health care not like a building institution but like a community service organization um because they might try these other more culturally relevant or or culturally traditional things first is that what you're saying yes sir they wanted to go to a facility it might be if there is uh, like Asian or uh, the one who where there are services provided by Asian. Got it. Thank you. Well, there might be there is some Asian doctors there. Yeah. So. Uh, Elaine, go ahead. Yeah. So, um, so my my favorite part about getting to work with the. Uh, community is is similar to what what Marcus said it's that that shared understanding because in um in the Asian uh culture um mental wellness mental health it's it's more than stigmatized it's it's beyond stigmatized to the point of taboo so um folks in the community they they won't they won't talk about um their mental wellness using those terms. And I'll um, I'll give some illustrations to make the point. So as, as one example, you know, I, I walk through our building um, from time to time and I see I see people in the waiting room and um, I, I speak other languages other, other than English as well. Um, and and so I'll, I'll hear people talking and um, some people might might recognize each other in the waiting room and say something along the lines of, Oh hi! What are what are you um, uh, here at our at the health center for? And no one will say the reason that they're there at the health center. They they will they will say anything um, to not say that that they're there for a behavioral health or mental wellness check. So for example, if somebody sees one of their neighbors in the waiting room, they they might say, "Oh, I hurt my back or I hurt my arm, um, uh, so I'm going to go see a doctor, a a physical doctor." Um, and then, and then, then I'll see them go through, go through the, um, there, cause there's a door that separates the waiting room to the examination, uh, area of our health center. So they'll, and then I'll see them go through the door and, um, then I'm on the other side of the door and I see them walking towards the, um, behavioral health, mental wellness, um, area of, of our health center. And and I know that they just told they just told their neighbor that they had an they hurt their arm or they hurt their back, and um, it's because people they don't talk about these topics. Period. And and if they do talk about uh, those topics, they're often um, ostracized or or shunned by their community as as being um, defective in some way. And because we are able to. Um, have that that shared understanding when we when we know that there are those barriers when someone who reflects the community member that we're serving tells them that it's okay it's okay to to um you know be to have these these challenges with your mental wellness then then they're much more willing to engage in um you know what what Ryan you referred to as you know institutional assistance um, so as, as opposed to, um, uh, cultural traditional practices, um, that might not have the same effect as the, the clinical work that, that we're doing in our health centers. Um, and the, the, I guess that's, uh, so that's both, I guess, at the same time, the, the favorite part is that, that mutual understanding that we're actually able to, assist the the community member because we're able to reach the community member and that's also simultaneously the challenge of um 
you know, working with with the community because we 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 know that these are their their practices, and um, um, but fortunately we we have that understanding, so we are able to meet them where they need us, and deliver the the service in in the way that um, that they would accept it. And I'll give another example. So um, even the word, even the word mental, like when we, even if we speak it in English and we have someone uh, interpret in another language, that word, we, we have to be very, very careful to not use that word in English because it will be interpreted by an interpreter because um, uh, there isn't another word uh, in all the other languages, as far as I can think of, there isn't another word that doesn't have an automatic negative connotation. So, um, so we have, uh, our, we're working on changing the wording that we use when we're in the clinic to not say mental, because as soon as you say mental, um, the community member will shut down because that word is an accusatory word, um, to the community that that's hearing it, even when it's trans when it's translated or interpreted. So, what we um, are suggesting as a better practice with the international community and particularly the the Asian community is to instead ask the question: um, Are you having positive thoughts today? When instead of instead of how is your mental wellness? Because even in Eng even when you say that in English. It sounds good, right? Mental wellness, but that's not how it's um, heard uh, when it's, when it's translated. When it's translated, it sounds to the other to the to the international person as "Are you crazy today?" <laughs> instead of instead of "How's your mental wellness?" So so we're we're and, and like I said, I, I I say these things speaking through the point of view of someone who speaks languages other than English. And knowing how it sounds when you interpret it into another language, so um, so instead, in, instead we we use words that ask for factual responses instead of drawing conclusions about the condition or status of the patient um, without first asking factual questions like. Are you having positive thoughts today? Because it gives the patient an opportunity to say, no, I'm not having positive thoughts today. And then you could follow up with what is causing you not to have positive thoughts today. And then they can fill it in with factual information as opposed to um, an accusation like, you know, are you feeling crazy today? Because that's how it sounds when you interpret it. Or, it, or, or, or even, even if it's, even if we don't use the word mental, if we say, are you depressed? That's also accusatory. You're accusing them of being depressed without finding out what's actually going on. Or are you feeling anxiety today? That's again, a conclusion. Those are all um, making the conclusion without seeking the facts to support whatever the, the, the inquiry is. So, um, so we are encouraging our, our team members to approach it differently because of how the community hears the question. Yeah, that's that's a point really well made. So, you know, what's really resonating for me, um, you know, over the last however many months, having these conversations and always tying in that component of stigma and mental health. You know, it's not unique to individual communities that there is a stigma attached to it where that stigma comes from and how people respond to it is definitely unique to each community but there is that shared understanding that you know mental health or or conversations related to mental health are kind of taboo um and what i think you said that i really hope that the audience was hearing um is the approach matters so that reframe instead of jumping right to either you know clinical language um, or, you know, making even observations. I think that's something that a lot of folks rely on as a way of building conversation. Like, oh, you seem down or your mood seems depressed. That is an observation, not asking for a factual response. So, you know, asking, are you having positive thoughts today? 
Um, I think that's a really great reframe for um, it's it's a both hand. It's a really great reframe for any time you are talking to a client or a patient who seems maybe resistant or apprehensive about that conversation, but specifically doing it from a culturally affirming way where, you know, you have perhaps the insight to know, hey, this is the better way to approach that question. I think that is um, a, a tremendously helpful um, uh, frame. And also specifically, even how you said, you know, there isn't a translatable sort of phrase that is, um, uh, I don't want to say politically correct. I, I don't like that expression. No, it's, it's it, it, yeah, <laughs> it's because like, it's not about political, it's not about political correctness. Right. It, it is, it is about um, creating a safe space for the person that you are trying to build trust, right. um, you know, among, and when you come at them in a way that's accusatory, they're going to shut down. Right. So, um, so I'll give an, I'll give another example that doesn't even have to be in the clinical space. And I'll, I'll give it as an, as an, as an example mm-hmm. in the DEI JB space. So diversity, equity, inclusion, justice, belonging space. So if you and I were to meet for the, for the first time and, um, and you wanted to know, um, uh, my cultural identity. So, the wrong way to do it would, would be to ask me, are you Chinese? That would be the wrong way to do it. So, so the right way to do it or the better, the better way to do it would be to ask me, um, so I'm just curious, uh, what is your heritage? That would be seeking, seeking a factual support for, you know, whatever, as opposed to imposing your point of view or your observation of me, um, and then having me having me say yes or no to it the same thing applies or a similar approach or a similar similar principle applies when engaging in these uh, clinical spaces it's better to let the person that you're seeking to build trust with tell you their point of view than to have you assert yours on them yeah i i also want to add like a caveat to that Um, I certainly wouldn't encourage anyone to walk up to a stranger and be like, what's your heritage? Um, You know, I always say like um, context and then also, you know, figuring out the root. Is it curiosity or is it necessity? Because if it's necessity, like you are trying to get to, you know, possibly like the, the right interpreter, for example, like you do have to be politely direct and say, you know, what languages are you familiar with? What's who's the best interpreter, et cetera. Um, if it's just out of curiosity or you're trying to build rapport with someone, you can find those open-ended uh, questions like you offered to not place your own, you know, sort of lens on it. I really appreciate that. Um, yeah, that- and that's why I prefaced, you know, I, I absolutely agree with you about the context yeah. mattering. Um, that's why I said just curious, you know, I started the, yeah. the sentence with just curious, what is your heritage Agreed. as opposed to something else. Right, right. Um, I want to do another quick housekeeping just for, because I know a couple of folks have um, jumped in. Please feel free to use the um, Q&A box for our participants. You can ask questions in there. Um, You can also raise your hand and that will show me who's trying to ask a question. We've saved some time at the end for specific audience questions, but just wanted to throw that out there. So I want to shift um, a little bit. I always... I try to be realistic about the conversations that we need to have. Um, I don't like to approach these types of conversation just from, you know, sort of the, oh, woe is us, the marginalized, let's talk about how hard it is. I, I like to, you know, make sure that we're including the beauty of resiliency and community. And, you know, we can't uncouple what the last few years have been like, specifically for Asian Americans and Pacific Island Pacific Islanders in America. So, you know, in 2020, we saw an increased visibility um, around violence against Asian Americans specifically um, due to the wild rampant misinformation and and, um, racism in in contemporary conversations. Um, So 
I, I think it's important to name that too, because so much of this um, formal DEIB work was sort of in response to, you know, the 2020 uh, racial reckoning across multiple identities. So, you know, increased visibility around police violence, increased visibility around attacks on AAPI people. And I always say increased in visibility because it's not new. These things have been happening to us forever. Um, so can you share what it was like during that time supporting the community and, um, you know, how the, the public outside of the world of Asia, the organization was sort of responding to, to that. Um, and whoever Eileen or, or sorry, Elaine and Marcus, whoever, um, feels called to speak first. Yeah. I don't know if Marcus, if you wanted to, to share, you know, you're, so you're, um, you're not, uh, Chinese or one of the one of what I would call like the Eastern Eastern Asian uh, Asians, and um, I I would say that probably um, there was this sense of um, monolithing all all Asians into one category and using um, racial epithets against uh, this this a broad community in sometimes a singular way. Um, I'll, I'll share that um, there were community members because because we serve a wide variety of um, you know, wide ranging countries within the continent of Asia. And not everybody is Chinese, not everybody is um, you know, Korean or Japanese or, or the ones that are, um, I guess, more, more familiar to um, people who live in the US. And we we serve people who are who are Hmong, who are Nepali, Bhutanese, Karen, um, Burmese, and but but we we have similar immutable characteristics. And unfortunately, there were people that lumped us all together and then shouted shouted racial racial um, epithets or or threw things, um, uh, which is an assault. I, I say that as a, as a lawyer. Um, which is an assault and spitting and, and all kinds of uh, terrible things that happened to the community over the past um, three years. And like you said, Ryan, this is not something that was is new. Asians have lived in the United States for more than 200 years. And um, in that span of time, um, there, there hasn't ever been um, a, a, a time when there wasn't racism uh, directed to people, yeah, directed to people who 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 reflect our our characteristics. And um I can share a couple of stories uh, actually. So I have a friend who's actually native and not not Asian at all. And um he he rode uh, he was riding his bicycle um in in the in uh in an open area and um Someone, someone knocked him, knocked him um, uh, unstable off of his bike, so he fell, fell to the ground, and then, sh and then said, um, "Go home," uh, you know, and then racial expletive uh, related to Chinese people. And he's not Asian at all, but, be but because he has, um, I mean, he has dark hair, and um, you know, he's native. He he's native, and unfortunately, um, because of racism and and honestly, stupidity, ignorance. Um, uh, he was attacked, and it was anti-Asian violence, but it was anti-Asian violence um, inflicted upon someone who wasn't even Asian. So, so that's how, um, you know, the community has experienced this, this terrible, um, you know, uh, ter terrible situation of hostility, and, and, and uh, you know, we, when, when schools closed because of the pandemic, Kids were often left um, on their own if their parents were um, having to work in places that didn't shut down during the pandemic, like if they worked in grocery stores or other essential services. Um, there were kids that were being sprayed with Lysol during, um, during the, the height of the pandemic, which is also an assault. That's also an assault. Um, and um, it's really unfortunate that um, there was that much ignorance and that much violence, 
against the um, AAPI community during that time. I don't know if Marcus, you want to share your your experience. Uh, yes, uh, as Elaine said, uh, I am with her. Uh, every, all those stories were uh, real, and uh, we bore this back in the camp. Um, whether we though we were in the same uh, community, the, the people of Nepal still as refugees, we uh, were spoken like in different way like a refugee, a sort of a way of putting down. So here, after the event, uh, issues that happened in US, uh, I didn't have much uh, um, experience, but still um, there are times of, like Rai, Rai our uh, ethnic rice and uh, Subhas, they are close to Chinese, their face, Facial, uh, everything is close to Chinese. And some they, they ask them, are you Chinese? And those go, uh, uh, they feel bad about that. They feel bad oh, after the uh, incident because of uh, coronavirus, it was brought from, they said that it is uh, from China. And they, they asked, oh, uh, they want to point that they did this. Uh, because of them, uh, this happened. He, and in the community, like after those uh, incident, there was a lot of people were scared or oh, what may happen. Uh, I went to the community I think, uh, in the, to bring my outreach work. When I talked to them, they, they were like, oh, how maybe we may have to leave from here also again. Some uh, situation may come that uh, they'll we have to, will be driven from here also. That sort of fear came out and because the, uh, it was uh, attack on the Asians, not as a community based term. It was uh, to all the Asians. They thought that, oh, maybe time will come again that uh, we have to leave uh, even USA. So those uh, sort of uh, conversation uh, was there in the community. They were scared, like mostly the old people, uh, those who are, 50 cent above, they, they are scared something may happen or then how can we live because of we don't know the language, how we can get out of this country. So that was a little fear that uh, few did talk about this. Yeah, that's, um, I, I want to specifically touch on what Marcus was saying because, um, you know, generational trauma, right? So Elaine, you mentioned this earlier, 200 years not a lot has changed in terms of sentiments towards Asian Americans, broadly speaking. Um, and lest we not forget, you know, the United States um, put Vietnamese Americans in camps, or no, I'm sorry, not Vietnamese Americans, put, um, I can only imagine the amount of people that were placed in camps from various backgrounds, just in general. Um, and um, that generational trauma sticks with communities, you know, do we need to leave again? Do we need to leave this place that we thought was safe because our communities at large are under attack? Um, I think that is something that maybe gets lost when we're talking just about these acute incidences, acute with air quotes around it, um, incidences of violence where it seems like, oh, this is specifically because hateful rhetoric related to COVID-19 or the coronavirus. Well, yes, but we also have to look at that in the larger context. We have children who are experiencing that type of violence, like Elaine said, but we also have parents and grandparents who can recall the Japanese internment camps. And now we're looking at how the government is responding and they're endorsing that type of violence at the time. And so I can only imagine, you know, serving the community while also trying to affirm that fear but not um, uh, like uh, uh, affirm it, but not scare people anymore. Like we have to acknowledge the reality of what people are afraid of, um, but not also stoke that fear. Is that is that fair? Yeah, I mean it's it's yeah. very complicated. Um, you know, it, I I don't know that we'll we, we will be able to. Um, you know, provide all the answers within, you know, a, a webinar or something like that. But but I will say that it is really important 
that um, communities of, of all colors are, are in solidarity yeah. with one another. I mean, I can't tell you um, how much it meant to the community when um, our, uh, our, our Black friends, our Hispanic Latino friends, our Native friends came together with with us as um, as the AAPI community when um, things were not were not going well and and we and we show, showed up and showed out to um, support one another. If I can share my screen for for one second to um, just share a picture because yeah. I, did, I just realized that there was somebody in the background of a picture that um, that a friend of mine had taken um, during a march that we held. Um, I just made you a pause. If I can share share this picture, so um, so so this is me. This is this is one of my friends, and 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 someone took this picture. I don't know who to give credit for for taking this picture, but but here I am, and I don't know if if anybody can recognize the person that I'm waving. That's Mayor waving, Trump. waving the the mouse around, but that's Mayor Bibb. Yeah, I didn't even know. I didn't even know that he he came out to our march through um, Cleveland's Asia Town. I just didn't have that awareness because I, I mean, I was, he was behind me. He was behind right. me anyways, but I mean, behind me, I guess in, in, in multiple ways, he was behind us yes. in, 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 in multiple senses, but, um, but I didn't realize he was, he was in this picture. And then when I shared this picture as part of um, like another presentation that I was giving uh, you know, about the rise of anti-Asian hostilities, the omission of APIs from, from a history curriculum taught in public schools, and then the pressures in, in AAPI families leading to this intergenerational trauma that we just kind of spoke about. But then, then I just noticed, uh, and someone pointed it out, like, you know, that's Mayor Bibb. And, and I was like, oh my gosh, it is. So, yeah. so I just can't tell you how meaningful it is. So, so I'd never seen um, in, in, in my lifetime uh, as, as, an, as an Asian American, this level of, of support um, around an issue that at that time was impacting the AAPI community. And it's just so, uh, so meaningful when, when we have solidarity across communities, across cultures, supporting each other. And, um, you know, there, there, there are other spaces where, where we, where we as the AAPI community will lock, lock arms in support of issues impacting communities other than our own. And I think that that is extremely important. And I just wanted to underscore that to, to everyone, that if you see injustice, even if it's not injustice against you personally, or even against your, your own community personally, stand, stand up. It's, if, it, if it's wrong, it's wrong. So yeah. sorry, I just had to, no, to, to, share, to share that real quick. I cannot say enough how much I appreciate that solidarity, period, you know, end of sentence. Um, we we are all fighting the same beast you know we are all fighting this this concept of, of white supremacy and the patriarchy that is you know holding us all under the same thumb and when we see our um our causes and our issues as um symptoms of that same illness then it's a lot easier to understand when i help them that's enough I, it shouldn't have to benefit me, but also understanding that when we help one community, we help our own in a lot of ways. And so even if you're like, well, I mean, I can't imagine that anyone's on this call. Like, I don't know if solidarity is for me, um, <laughs> but understanding that it is also self-serving. Like we are all working together to overthrow, you know, this oppressive system. So um, I really appreciate you saying that. I want to, you know, I have this one quick question that was, um, following that around the attention paid to it, but I want to be mindful of time because, you know, what it looked like in 2023, or I'm sorry, what it looked like in 2020 to what it looks like in 2023, you know, the enthusiasm has waned in a lot of ways around supporting certain marginalized issues. Is that something that you see within your organization, within you know, this type of movement building, or are you still seeing sort of a sustained level of interest? I mean, we don't, we don't allow, we don't allow interest to wane. Sure. So, so, so we keep showing up. Yeah, we keep showing up and we, we keep uh, organizing. 
until until we achieve the changes that we're seeking. So period, hard stop. Great. I love that answer. <laughs> and I think I want to get it tattooed like on my forehead. Um, so I want to focus, I want to combine a couple of the last questions, um, you know, asking about, you know, everyday or not everyday um, trends, but maybe specifically to Marcus, you know, um, what are you seeing, you know, right now in terms of um, issues or concerns that community members need particular support in? Like, what are what are some hot button issues that folks should be paying attention to um, beyond the, the expected things? I think it's so, um, my to my understanding, the best uh, way to uh, support the community is um, make them know uh, the resources that are available, reach out to them, educate uh, the community uh, the best. Uh, that's what uh, uh, they wanted to know, and uh, to the best of possibility, let uh, any uh, providers know more about uh, the uh, community and the culture best uh, approach would be good that uh, that's what uh, they wanted to see i think yeah thanks elaine are there uh, are there things that are sort of happening that you know at, at the executive level i'm sure you have a a, a good oversight but um are there issues or trends that you're seeing? Yeah, so um, so in the in the clinical space, um, the it's it's very sad, honestly, for for, for me to share this fact that um, that the leading cause of death for um, AAPIs um, ages fifteen to twenty three is suicide. Um, that's that that's it's higher than car accidents. Uh, murder, um, uh, heart disease. It's it's uh, it's uh, it's it is the leading cause of death. It's, it's suicide, <clears throat> and unfortunately, um, in the community that we're serving, we see a high level of 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 suicides, and it is from uh, pressures to uh, a su support and adjust in in a new country. Um, there, there are pressures from parents who uh, brought their young children to this country and have exceeding, exceedingly high expectations for, for their children to be the voice of their family and um, really just carry, carry adult responsibilities when they are, they are not age ready to, to be an adult. And so, um, I mean, I... I, I, I talk to the, the young people all the time. And um, I guess I'm lucky, I'm very lucky that they are honest with me and share share all the responsibilities that they have, such as um, you know, if their parents are are working to to make ends meet because they have to be, they have to, you know, uh, support their families and things like that. Sometimes young children are taking care of all their their younger siblings, and they the families that we serve are typically many, many children of uh, families, large numbers of children in the families. And um, additionally, uh, if the parents are not able to read or comprehend English, that child is also thrust into the responsibility of being the interpreter for the family. Um, I personally, uh, you know, I was very lucky that my my mom or my parents, you know, did not need need my assistance to be their interpreter, but my grandma, my grandma did. And so, so she would always, um, you know, we, we would always go to the grocery store together. So, so I would, I would take my grandma to the grocery store. She would give me the money, and, um, and, and I mean, I guess like a light, a light end of it, of, of it, or to bring some levity to to that uh, kind of situation, or the responsibility of me having to be the child interpreter for for my grandma, um, was that I always got candy at the end because I, I told my grandma, I told my grandma that, um, of course, they always throw in a bag of Skittles. Um, with every every grocery purchase, and and so um, you know, I, I mean, th that was my treat for being the interpreter for 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 my grandma for for the afternoon, 
But, but the reality is, is that children should not be serving in the role of interpreter for their family, period. They, um, it, it's terrible in the school context as one example, you know, like, let's say, let's say that the teacher sends home a note with the child that says, um, you need to come in for parent teacher conference. Your child is not, uh, is, is struggling in these areas. Okay. That same child, that same child should not be the interpreter for that parent, uh, parent teacher conference, because the child is, is not going to probably disclose all of the um, the issues that the teacher might be bringing up. So, so there's definitely a ex extreme and uh, important need for professional interpretation, uh, third party, not, um, not someone with a, a vested interest in the outcome of that conversation that they might control by being the, the, the interpreter or the go-between. Um, so, so, so these are, these are just, um, you know, a couple of examples of, just responsibilities that are put on children that that are too young um, to to be put in those situations. Yeah, um, I have two quick follow up questions about that, and then we'll wrap up um, with a perhaps a lighter question. Um, first and foremost, so earlier you were talking about um, you know mindfulness and how we approach the questions about mental health. Um, and also, you know, we know sort of as a, um, a, a best practice that when assessing suicidality, for example, um, you don't want to beat around the bush. Like, you don't want to say like, oh, you're not thinking about hurting yourself, are you? Because then that is leading, you know, the response that you might get. So is there, and again, I'm not expecting you to answer for, for everybody, but I guess maybe just a little... Um, connection between what you were saying related to mindfulness and how you ask those questions, but still being straightforward in assessing risk of, of suicidality. Yeah, I'm going to defer that question to, to Marcus. I am not qualified to sure. answer, to answer that question, but um, um, yeah. Go ahead, Marcus. Yeah, it could be hard with the, uh, this set of questions. Like, uh, if uh, it's very hard to ask a direct question, uh, do you have a tendency to suicide? Are you planning to do things? Oh, then they will completely shut uh, shut down. Then we have to take round in a different way so that they can. Um, it may take a long time if it's asked directly uh, to our community. Uh, people or uh, anyone client, then they will never answer. So we have to ask uh, in a different way. You know, anytime we asked, uh, I did a lot of interpretation with the uh, medical uh, people and at uh, uh, mental health, uh, uh, with the mental health clients. Um, and they never said, oh, I have planned to. They never, not even a single time I heard that way. I am no, so it is very hard. Um, I didn't have uh, much experience how they would answer and how, uh, what could be the answer. So, but it is very hard question to ask in our community. Yeah, this question. So it's maybe still asking those um, supportive questions and those you know, uh, positively framed questions, but still getting to the root of you know, what's going on in your head? You know, what is, what are these thoughts like? What are, what is it driving you to do or think about um, and not just throwing out suicide or not just throwing out depression? Um, since, yeah. Yeah, since we are to ask that question directly, those are the formatted, uh, formatted questions. So we have to ask, that's okay. But uh, I have never been to a point of during my interpretation uh, answering that, oh, uh, I have, I have planned to suicide. Maybe yeah. did not, or maybe didn't want to. Uh, uh, express, uh. Yeah. So it's a hard question. So <laughs> the last question that I want to ask you all before we wrap up, um, what do you? Uh, so it's it's kind of, you know, maybe surface level, but. Um, what does this month mean to you? What does AAPI Heritage Month mean to you as individuals and as people who serve your community? We'll start with well, Marcus and then I'll oh, sorry, go ahead. 
Sir Marcus. Okay. Uh, to me, uh, like uh, this means uh, trying to. Um, oh, sorry. Am I okay? Uh, API API means uh, to me it is knowing uh, what Asian culture is trying to um, present their uh, views, their uh, needs uh, to the uh, community here, uh, here in. Um, here in M uh, US, you are in, here in S US. So make them know uh, their uh, needs, their feelings, their culture, so that we can cooperate together, uh, assist, assisting them to their need of service. So that's what my feeling API means. Thank you. Yeah, so uh, last weekend, um, Saturday and Sunday in um, Asia Town or Cleveland's Asia Town, there was um, Cleveland's Asian Festival. And it was a wonderful event that was extremely well attended. I mean, there were tens of thousands of people that came through. And um, we, we have a lot of uh, community members that we work with and um, staff, you know, who, who uh, also reflect the community that we serve. And um, I heard uh, one of the one of our team members say out loud because it was their first it was their first Cleveland Asian Festival. So, so they said out loud, man, if um, if there were more events like this uh, to to celebrate our culture, everyone in, in our community would would just feel more welcome. And this uh, circles back to something that you said uh, earlier on in our conversation, Ryan, about how if we want to um, make people, you know, stay here and, and, and not want to, you know, uh, go, go somewhere else, the, the, this idea of, of, of welcoming, because it's, like, um, it's like when, when uh, um, I don't know, like maybe when you're little or something like that, you, you, you might uh, sleep over at someone's house for the first time and you're away from your, your bed, your, the bed that you are familiar with and things like that. And, um, but if you're not comfortable and, and you're, you're not made to feel welcome or you're not having a good time, you're gonna call, you're gonna call your parents, please come pick me up, I wanna go home. And, um, and it's that same, same feeling for, for newcomers, for new arrivals, for people who are either um, coming to Northeast Ohio as immigrants, refugees, or secondary migration to um, Northeast Ohio from another state um, in the US, that uh, if they feel welcome they're, and there's a sense of belonging, that they're having a good time where, where they are, that they're experiencing good things in, in this area, they're going to want to stay. Otherwise, they're going to feel like we're under attack. We need to, we, we want to go home or whatever. So, um, you know, to, to, to the, the sleepover example I gave earlier, uh, not to the, to the racist go home uh, <laughs> epithet. Right. So, um, so, so I, I, I'll just, I guess I'll just, just say that, that if, if there were um, more opportunities to, to feel welcome, to feel like we can share our culture with others and that it's accepted and not questioned or uh, ridiculed or something along those lines, um, the community would, would you know, want to stay here and feel, feel that they belong. Thank you so much. Yeah. And thank you both for sharing um, you know, parts of your culture, sharing your favorite parts of, you know, certain cultural aspects and um, your unique insights um, into the work. I'm just tremendously grateful that you all took this time on a Friday afternoon. Um, thank you all so much for joining us. A huge thank you once again to Elaine and Marcus for joining us. I know it's 103, so folks are like slowly but surely dropping off. Um, it was incredible to have you all here. Thank you again for sharing your insight and your expertise. Treat everyone like the nervous kid at the sleepover and make them feel comfortable. Put on yes. their favorite movie maybe and, and make sure that they know that they can call their parents if they need to. Um, but yeah, it is it is so much of what you were sharing has resonated with what others have shared during various cult casual conversations about you know understanding that we all are unique and there is this shared experience that many of us have around um, apprehension and asking for help for whatever reason it may be. Um, but we all do need that support, whether it's directly from our communities or it's from 
individuals or organizations supporting our communities, whatever it is, collectively, we will do better because to Elaine's point earlier, solidarity, period, hard stop. Um, thank you so much. Um, we will, I'll send you the link for the recording, uh, wishing you a very happy rest of the Asian American Pacific Islander Heritage Month. And um, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Take care, everyone. Thank you very much for inviting us. Thanks, Marcus. Thank you, Elaine.